So I started to work with Lennox from that point on. And his first fight, I think, was with Lionel Butler. He was a little cautious still and a little gun shy, but eventually we got back on track. Don King called me and told me, you must have lost your mind. You're going to give up the heavyweight champion of the world and also Julio Cesar Chavez, who I was training at the time. He said, you're going to give up both of these guys? And when Mike gets out the joint, you can work with him. And he's going to make like $20 million as soon as he gets out. You'll have him too. I said, nope, I'd rather go with Lennox. I always knew what Lennox could do. And it was like a challenge to me to see if I could develop what I always thought was there. As a result, I spent a little time and actually think my first fight was about $20,000 or I don't know what it was. But eventually, Lennox came back and as you know, he went on to become one of the top reigning and longest reigning heavyweight champions we've ever had. When I first took over our training, Lennox Lewis, the areas that I focused on, which is what I do with all fighters, is the footwork. He didn't use his jab that much either for being a tall guy. His jab was more of just a probe that he would use just to feel someone out, just to throw a big right hand. I worked on him becoming a very effective boxer where he developed a good solid jab. Also, I taught him how to tie up guys a lot of the time when they got too close. He developed a pretty good array of uppercuts, body punches, left hooks, and he developed into an all the way around balanced good fighter. But I basically worked with him on his jab and his balance, and later on, he became probably one of the best jabbers in the history of the heavyweight division, and his balance improved a lot because he used to have a habit of crossing his legs. I also tried to improve him on keeping his right hand in a better position because oftentimes he would keep his right hand either on the side of his face or sometimes he would actually even cross it over to the right side of his jaw. I tried to get him to focus more on trying to keep the right hand in the direct center of his chin, which made it easier for him to explode a lot faster. Not any fancy tricks or anything. It was just basic fundamentals, good balance, and a good solid jab, and that was about it. Going into the second fight with Oliver McCall, it was really kind of strange. We didn't have any really pent up anxiety or extra uncomfortable feelings or anything. You know, I'm so used to being in these situations all my life, even in the amateurs with my kids all boxing each other, all fighting each other, and never taking anything personal. I've always been like that. But Lennox, I think, was still a little uncomfortable during the fight because at times when he should have stepped to Oliver, I think he was still reluctant that he may run into something and I could see that in him. That's why at a certain point, I just backed off trying to make him be overly aggressive. And then he was kind of confused because, I mean, how many times do you have a grown man start crying in front of you and just backing away? So Lennox did not know what to do. And I could understand that. I was totally confused as I think the rest of the world was. Then in between the confusion and also not knowing if he was trying to be suckered into something like he got caught in the first fight, Lennox was a little just uncomfortable with the whole situation. But for me, I had no real problems at all because I knew that Oliver was no longer the Oliver that I had when I trained him. I knew he was just an ordinary fighter, to be honest with you, at that time. Emotionally, the way I had Oliver so charged in that fight and the personal time, which was one of the best that I ever did with a boxer and the tactics, I knew nobody else could or would train him that way. So I just had no anxiety at all myself. But Lennox, I think, was a little uncomfortable. And as the fight progressed, the strange things that happened just added to the drama. What was interesting about Lennox and was special, he was very, very detailed about everything. When I first got involved with him, he had all of these baggy black shirts and he had some thumbless boxing gloves because Pepe, who had trained Ray Leonard, that's what Ray trained in, I guess, basically because Ray had that detached retina thing. I made him get rid of them type of gloves and I told him I didn't believe in all that black baggy stuff. I like bright colors. I strongly believe that there is energy in bright colors. Red, which is the energy color of the universe, gold, white, and colors like that. 
So eventually Linux adjusted to my desires of training habits and things. And eventually we got to work very well. I will say this, he was one of the best training guys that I ever worked with, with his dedication. He liked to play chess. He studied everything. He asked lots of questions about everything continuously. And when you were working with Linux, whatever you would ask Linux to do, Linux would do that. And that's what made him to me, my favorite heavyweight that I ever trained, even though I worked with Holyfield and other fighters. When Linux was fighting like Ray Mercer, he was coming back, I think about the eighth round. I told him, Linux, we're going to have to step it up this next round because I think the fight is dead even. Linux looked at me and I remember his mouth was bleeding. He was like, what do you mean? Because he thought he was winning the fight. But I was watching and Mercer would throw an uppercut or something like that and land a punch and the whole crowd was cheering and they were hollering, USA, USA, USA. Then he would push Linux into the ropes or whatever and I realized there was a good chance we were going to lose the fight. Linux said, okay. He goes out and he wins the next two rounds real big and we find out that was the difference in him winning the majority decision. The Ray Mercer fight was very, very close. It was actually a really, really good fight. But up until that point, Lewis still had this reputation among the American boxing media and American boxing circles in general of being fragile, of being chinny, of lacking heart, and so on. The American boxing press would openly mock Lennox Lewis on a very regular basis and constantly bang on about these British stereotypes of Lennox Lewis sipping tea and eating crumpets and all this kind of business. And constantly bang on about the stereotype of the horizontal British heavyweight. But after the Mercer fight, I noticed the change in attitude among the American press, among American fighters. And it wasn't just because of the toughness and the heart and the punch resistance and the grit that Lewis showed in that Mercer fight. It was also the fact that Mercer himself conceded that Lewis turned out to be better than he expected him to be. Mercer said he thought he would be able to catch Lewis the way McCall caught him and just blast him out of there. But Lewis turned out to be a lot tougher than he anticipated, had a lot more fire and grit and determination and inside fighting ability. That was the first time in a long time that Lewis actually had to show inside fighting ability because pretty much from the Mike Dixon fight all the way through to the Tommy Morrison fight several years later, Lennox Lewis hadn't really fought on the inside. He'd shown glimpses of the ability to fight up close against Morrison, against Phil Jackson, maybe one or two others. But for the most part, it was all long range from Lennox Lewis. But in the Ray Mercer fight, he stood toe to toe for long periods of the fight and they had vicious exchanges. And Lewis did some very, very impressive work. And I remember reading in the American Boxing Rags after that fight that they were impressed with his combinations up close. They weren't impressed with the fact that he wasn't able to deal with Ray Mercer as well as, let's say, Evander Holyfield, but they were impressed that Lewis showed the ability to fight up close, which he hadn't shown in a long time, probably not since he fought Levi Billups. And that wasn't a particularly impressive performance either by Lewis against Billups, but he did fight on the inside a lot in that particular contest. But as I say, when Mercer came out and gave Lewis his props after the fight, the American boxing press and many of Lennox Lewis's rivals and even American fans begrudgingly started to give Lewis more credit. That is when I noticed a turning of the tide when it comes to the way Lennox Lewis was viewed in the United Lewis States. complained after the fight that the ring was very small. He said that they initially had agreed to a much bigger ring, I think a 22 foot ring or 24 foot ring, I forget now, but he ended up in a much smaller ring than he thought he'd be in. And therefore he didn't have the room because he's a tall guy, six foot five. Ray Mercer's a much shorter guy, about six one. He didn't have the room to move about 
and use his jab and keep Mercer at a distance. So you know, he said, as soon as he took two steps back, his back was hitting the ropes. And that's why, according to him, Mercer was able to get so close and was able to hit Lewis in exchanges and what have you. But Lewis was prepared for that too. Him and Manny Stewart had worked on throwing uppercuts and short punches. It turned into more of a slugfest than a boxing match. Although Ray Mercer actually had a lot of success with his jab in the Lennox Lewis fight. Both guys finished the fight looking pretty busted up at the end. If memory serves me correct, the Mercer fight was the fight immediately after Mike Tyson had paid Lennox Lewis three or four million dollars step aside money so he could go ahead and fight. Was it Bruce Seldon or Holyfield at the time? I'm pretty sure it was right before the Mercer fight, or maybe it was right after the Mercer fight. Either way, it was around that time. Lewis, in the post fight interview, said that the Mercer fight was perfect preparation for Mike Tyson because Ray Mercer brings enough pressure. That was the exact quote from Lewis. And Mike Tyson brings enough pressure. But the general consensus at the time was that Lewis did the right thing in taking the step aside money because based upon his performance against Mercer, he wasn't ready for Mike Tyson. But I'm not so sure about that because in retrospect, when you look back, Mike Tyson shortly afterwards was beaten up and stopped by Evander Holyfield in 11 rounds and Holyfield was nowhere close to his prime when he managed to do that. There were chinks in Mike Tyson's armor which had gone undetected after he came out of prison and regained the heavyweight title. Ray Mercer was a pressure fighter like Mike Tyson, yes, but he was several inches taller, he had a longer reach, he had a more effective jab at long range against a guy like Lennox Lewis. And that was the punch really that gave Lewis the most trouble in that fight. He'd also had trouble with Frank Bruno's jab a couple years earlier. As the old adage goes, you can't hook with a hooker, but you can jab with a jabber. And Lennox Lewis, despite having a very good jab, he did have issues with other jabbers over the years. I know Mike Tyson fans always go on about how he out-jabbed Tony Tucker, who was also 6'5", but that was one fight. Mike Tyson, in most of his world championship fights, was not out-jabbing his opponents. That's a fact, but they always want to focus on the Tony Tucker fight. I do not think that Mike Tyson, even in his prime, would have been out-jabbing Lennox Lewis. I'm not saying that he couldn't have beaten Lennox Lewis, but I don't think he would have been out-jabbing him. Ray Mercer, of course, was famed for his iron jaw at the time, but he suffered nerve damage in his neck in the Lennox Lewis fight, which would eventually require surgery. And after that surgery, Ray Mercer's famed punch resistance was never the same again. 